in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to be here at your feet. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us and all the sisters who have turned up this evening. Father, like you turn up every single Saturday for us, like you turn up in all our prayer meetings, like you turn up in all our fellowships, like you turn up, Holy Spirit, turn up again. May tonight be a night where we are blessed abundantly. May we listen and, and, and hear the great testimony of what you can do for you are God all by yourself. Thank you, Father, for all that you do. Indeed, we are grateful. Father, we pray that you be in our midst, steer every proceeding tonight. Give sisters the confidence to share. Give us all the confidence to know that we are in a safe place where we can speak about you in confidence and are not worried. Thank you, Lord. You are in control. Thank you. In Jesus' mighty name do I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. So Amen. Uh, it's so great to have Sister Na here. And um, I am so blessed to, to, to sit at your feet this evening, especially um, with the topic that we have this evening. You know, um, when, when it came up, we were all pretty excited about it. But when we think about dealing with depression, and um, talking to God through it all. Um, I remember when I was doing the write-up, the first thing that came to mind was Isaiah 61, verse 3. You know, Isaiah 61, verse 3, speaks about to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for the oil of joy for, the, for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, the spirit of heaviness that weighs down on people is depression. That, and once God has given you a, a solution to it, that you may be, you, that they might be called trees of righteousness, a planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now, thank you so much for turning up. Just to testify to what God did through Isaiah 61 verse 3. You know, we, we are sometimes plagued with thoughts and fears and the devil then uses it against us. We are so, so excited to hear how God took you through this journey and how successful um, he has made you. So now without much ado, you are welcome now. I pray you've had a good day and yeah. you're excited to share with us. So welcome sister Na. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I, I think you've already introduced me. Um, yes. When I was um, invited to come and share, mm. uh, this is the first time I'm actually sharing publicly. I normally wow. talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, but this is the first time I'm actually sharing to a group of people. And it was, I kept asking the Holy Spirit that what should I even talk about? Because for me, um, it's been, there are so many different aspects to it. Um, I went through a depressive episode, not just once, but um, several times in my life. And so I was just wondering where from it, which angle should I start speaking from? But then I trust that the Holy Spirit through me would be able to uh, minister unto all of us tonight and we will all get to at least learn something, support each other. And from today, even if the um, thoughts come, even if we get, um, we are going through diff difficult times that make us start doubting who we are in Christ, we will remember something that we heard today and we'll know that we all have a supportive group of women who are there to listen if we ever have issues and who are also there to pray with us. Because, um, um, so I'll just start with this verse, Revelation 12, 11. It says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So for me, that's the reason why I'm here today, because we all know that as Christians, we've been bought by the blood of the lamb. So automatically, 
once you confess unto Christ and you confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and personal Savior, you are saved and you are bought by his blood. And there's a second dimension on it, of it, which is the confession side, which is us actually saying stuff. So we all know that even sometimes you declaring certain things, something that you're afraid and you're saying, I'm not afraid. It makes a difference because the more you declare, the more you build up your faith and you banish certain thoughts and certain um, emotions that might not necessarily be coming from God. So um, to start with, um, I just wanted to give a little context to why depression is normally a very difficult topic for us to talk about, especially um, in Africa. And uh, we all know that in the social cultural context in Africa, we don't talk about mental health. We don't talk about um, being anxious. We don't talk about being scared, being afraid, being um, unprepared, feeling inadequate. Um, we normally keep these thoughts to ourselves because the thing is, most of the time, if you open up to talk about something, people might even say you are crazy or you are mad. So every time, the only acceptable sickness is physical sickness. But once it's something that you can't quite explain, that the symptoms are not physical, it becomes an issue because then you could get stigmatized. Even your family could get stigmatized because we have certain, you know, when um, in our traditional um, context, when people are going to get married, they go and do searches in, some, in, in, in families and they ask, how is this family's history like? So if there's even a history of someone maybe having certain mental health issues, um, it's not just depression. Sometimes some people have um, bipolar disorder. So one day they are very high, they are hyper. The next day they are down. And all those things we, traditionally we ask. And sometimes you'll be advised not to marry from a certain home because it's believed that the people have a certain have uh, maybe mental health issues or some people are dealing with some issues. So even from the cultural context, we are not really encouraged to speak about things that are going are not going well. If someone greet, meets you and you are greeting, they ask you, how are you? It's the same. Rebecca say, yeah. Or you say it's okay. You will never really open up because as much as we are communal and we do care about each other, people don't want to really hear the deep things. Like I'm not doing well, I'm not doing okay. I feel down, I feel sad. So it makes mental health issues and depression something that is very difficult for us to talk about. And even for me, when I was asked to come and share, I was thinking, hey, I don't want to put myself out there. But then again, then again, even when the times that I was going through the depressive episodes, the Holy Spirit was still, now I know it was the Holy Spirit. But then for me, at that time, I just felt like writing helps. So I used to write things down. Um, later on during the talk, I will read some of the things that I wrote because that would be more of a first-hand experience about what was really going through my mind at that time. Right now, things have changed a lot so although I can look back and talk about it, um, it it's not really like I'm in the moment um, as it is. Um, so um, I want, another thing I wanted to touch on is, apart from the social cultural context, that makes it difficult for us to talk about what we are going through uh, mentally. Another thing is, um, insufficient resources most of the time we are thinking about the very basic things in life like we're thinking about things like malaria we're thinking about things like um cholera so if you come and you're saying oh i'm not feeling well that everyone people around you might think you're just being a bit difficult just suck it up and move on and that's one especially for men they don't have space to just like safe spaces just relax and say okay you know what financially i'm really struggling so all of us keep bottling stuff inside we all we are all smiling sometimes you are going through a lot you might be going through a lot in 
a relationship, you might be going through a lot in marriage, but you're supposed to just suck it up and just smile. So all these things sometimes bottle up and then it comes to a point where you feel like you can't take it anymore. And then even there are times that people start getting um, suicidal, people start just expressing in different ways. But we have some people who are constantly angry. They have like their demeanor, their demeanor is always like, they're just not nice people. If you sometimes go back, you see that maybe that person was hurt 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So in their mind, there's a mindset that maybe these people are this. Because, you know, um, culturally, we can sometimes, sometimes again, someone can tell you that this tribe, they are this way. Or this, these, these people, people who come from this part of um, the country, they are a certain way. And it's all because sometimes we go through certain experiences and instead of talking it through, instead of venting or finding outlets and Sorry, sorry, Na. Um, I think your your Wi-Fi is dropping a bit. We're fantastic at the beginning. It's just dropped a little bit as you started talking about cultural tags. I don't know if you can hear me. Inside, because we feel like. Oh, she's back. Fantastic. Sorry, sis. You dropped off a little bit, and you've it's gone quiet again. I can see your microphone is up, but I can't hear anything. So, so sorry, I, a call came through. I'm using my phone, a call came through and unfortunately it cut the line, but I'm back now. My apologies. Okay. Okay. Um, so today I'd just like to talk about my experience with um, depression and then what I learned after that period because during the period I don't think that I was open to any kind of learning and the things that I do to cope now and also a little bit about what I've read in the bible about certain biblical characters um, who also suffered similar went through um, similar uh, um, states and most of the time when we talk about depression it's as if it's a taboo topic in our homes. It's, ta it's a taboo topic in church. It's a taboo topic. You're just not supposed to talk about, about things like that. Because if you believe in God, why are you down? Why do you think you want to take your life if you believe in God? So it makes it very difficult for us to open up because we feel like we are alone. But then if you actually search through the Bible, you see that there are certain characters who also went through what, of some of what we are going through. And even if when you go to the Psalms, a lot of them were written from a place of anguish when David was writing some of the Psalms because he was a man who went through a lot. So that should tell us that our Christian walk is not just a walk of um, everything being good, but then there are the good times and there are the times that are not so good that we think are the bad times. But though during those times, it could be different things. It could be that God is taking you through a certain phase to build you up to a certain level. It could even be that he's taking you away from certain things that you are used to. So sometimes, and it could also be that he's giving you a story for another day. For me, I think that I went through what I did so that one day I'll be able to also talk to other people. And the thing is, sometimes when you haven't experienced something before, you never... You, you can talk about it, but then it might not be the same as if you have gone through it before. So there are different reasons why we all go through certain things. And I'm hoping that today, as I share um, my story, someone would um, be blessed. So be, um, I'd just like to read a little bit that something that I wrote, I think it was probably like six years ago when I was going through a very difficult period. And um, why I'm starting with this is that um, I just wanted to share a first hand because this is when I was actually um, feeling a certain way. And I'm thinking that if I share this first hand, those who might be in the call, who might be feeling will know that they are not alone, but then it happens, but it's possible for you to go like overcome. So, um, I'll just, I'll just read a little. I struggle with depression. I only self-diagnosed. 
I only recently self-diagnosed, but I've always been overwhelmed by emotions, even as a child, to a point where I even tried to commit suicide when I was younger. Needless to say, it didn't work out and I'm still here. Um, it's, it's a lot, so I'm just trying to not read everything. Five to, five to 12, that's the most difficult part of the day for me, five to 12. Sometimes it extends beyond 12 into two or three, maybe four, but most work nights, five to 12. Eight to five, so this, the, in this, I was talking about the hours, like from 5 p.m. to 12 p.m. When I'm, str I'm struggling to sleep, I'm, I'm with my thoughts and all of a sudden, life is dawning on me that your life is not good. Like, you, you, like everything is going wrong, nothing is going well, that kind of thing. So I'm like, eight to five is fine. I have people around me, I'm smiling, and I'm pretending to be happy. Sometimes I'm even happy. I always have the smile plastered on my face. You think the world is at my feet and actually sometimes it is. I almost believe it's myself, especially on the good days. From eight to five, to five, I forget about everything. There's so much noise, there's so much activity. It clouds my thoughts and I don't have to face reality. Well, I don't have to face the other side of my reality because eight to five is reality too. But during that time, I don't have to face a different reality, the unpleasant reality that is my life. Don't get us wrong, my life is great. I'm a successful, intelligent career woman. I work in one of the best firms in Ghana. I earn a very generous income for someone who is just four years out of school. I am happy, I really am. My life is good, it really is. At least I've been trying to tell myself that it is. I don't know why I can't be more grateful about my life. Don't judge me by saying I need Christ. I'm a good Christian. I try to be, I love God. I try to understand him for myself and live that Christ-like life. You see, that's the problem. My life outside looks perfect, but inside I have depression. I struggle with depression. I just self-diagnosed recently myself after going through a series of emotional ups and downs. I'm 27 and I struggle with depression. It's a mental illness and it's one of those things no one talks about not even my supportive friends and family, not the church. When you seem to have it all together, you're supposed to be invincible. You're not supposed to be broken in your head, which I am. In this world we live in, the only acceptable sickness is that of the body, the one they can prescribe pills for. That's why I can't talk about my other reality. I've really considered getting professional help. For the past year, it's been on my mind, but I don't even know where to start or who to speak to. I don't want to be a statistic. I have my bad days, I have my good days, but when things are not bad, I still struggle with traces of depression. The thing, that's the thing. I can never be happy for a long time. Something always happens. I think too much. I have anxiety issues, always strung up. The only progress is that I am not going to commit suicide. I've thought about it so many times and it's just not an option in this case. Not that I haven't tried it before. Okay, this might be a bit triggering, so I'm not going to read that. Um, but then this is something that I was, um, I think six years ago when I was going through a very depressive state. And if you listened, I keep saying it's fine, but I'm feeling a certain way. And it was actually, because if I look back, there were still so many blessings that I could count, but then my life was predicted on certain things that I wanted certain things to happen. And because maybe that one particular thing. Right now, I can't even really remember exactly what it was then. But then because that one thing was not happening, I was super depressed. And I felt like, God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you not talking to me? Why are you not doing this? So it took me through a period where um, I felt like I know what the right thing is. Because at that time, although I wasn't like a mature, mature Christian, I had been through enough experiences with God for me to know that one, God exists and so many supernatural things have happened in my life. So I just can't deny that. I'd also been through enough to know that suicide was not an option, although it was something that I think I thought about. But I just knew that you have your life ahead of you. You have the promises of God ahead of you. So that is not an option. But then before that, 
in the very very early stages, I think um, I dealt with um, depression even as a child, and even as adults in our culture, it's like even adults uh, when you are depressed, you're like ah, but it's not that bad. So for a child to have been, now I know I was depressed as a child. And for a child to be depressed, it's like, but what is wrong? Like, what problem do you have as a child? But the thing is that sometimes we hear that there are kids as young as maybe even 11 years old, 11 years old 12 years old, who are, um, I, I, I don't want to use the word suicide, but who are trying to take their own lives. And when we hear it, it's like an anomaly. But why, what problems could a little kid possibly have that will make them think that not being alive is an option for them when they have their whole lives ahead of them? And since we've all been children before, we know that those problems we had back then, unless for most of us now, we know that they might not have been as big as we thought they were. So for me, even as a child, I think I, I just was a very intentional, I internalize a lot of things. So when something happens, I just internalize it and I feel like mommy doesn't love me. I actually really thought my mom didn't love me when I was younger because I was that kind of person that if you tell me, let's say, do the dishes, it has to make sense to me. So you can't just tell me, Chila, do the dishes if I'm not the one who um use the plates or something. I think someone else should be doing it because they you. So I used to have a lot of conflicts when I was younger. And at a point I used to think, okay, you know what? My mom doesn't love me. So let me take my life. I actually tried. I took pills. It didn't work, thank God. Nothing even happened. I think I, I think that they probably took about 20 pills and I went to sleep hoping that the next morning I won't be there. I woke up the next morning. There was nothing wrong with me. I wasn't even, I didn't even have a tummy ache, nothing. So I just kept it to myself and moved on because the next day, whatever it was, I was so overwhelmed about the day before had just didn't seem that significant anymore. I was still upset, but then since I'm here, maybe I wasn't meant to do this, but that was quite young, maybe 12, 13, 14, I'm not very sure. But as I grew older, as things happened, I think I don't process them well and I get overwhelmed because everything could be going well. But then if I'm fixated on a certain thing, like maybe I'm fixated on, I have to pass a certain exam and I pass all the other papers and then that paper I don't pass, it could start triggering something. Then if another thing happens that didn't go the way I wanted it to go, it will trigger something again. Then if a third thing, so within like maybe a few months, little triggers and I start feeling God doesn't love me. He doesn't do this. He doesn't care, blah, 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 blah. But then looking back now, I know that sometimes all those things are in fact lies because sometimes it's not even what it is. So sometimes you are thinking, maybe I want this. I'm not getting on. This should be happening at this time. But because my timeline is not God's timeline, I begin to start fretting and start feeling like, why, why is this not happening? Then it means he doesn't love me. So I don't know if there's anyone in the audience who feels like that sometimes. I sound like, but I'm not saying this to dismiss those feelings. Those feelings can be very valid. But then... It's a, it should never be the reason why you doubt God's love for you because in his own time, he makes all things beautiful. So eventually, when the time is right, when you're supposed to have what is supposed to come, you will have it and you know that, oh, so this was going to happen after all. Or it might even be that that thing is not right for you at that time. It will never be right for you and fit into your life because if you get it, it might trigger something else. But the thing is that the way life is, we can never tell the beginning from the end. So um, an example I'd like to give is um, that King Hezekiah, when he 
the prophet went to him and told him that God said, I should tell you to prepare because you're going to die. And he cried to God and he asked God for some extra years because he had been a righteous man. He would have been better off for those of us who read the account in the Bible. He might have been better off if he had just accepted and passed on. But then because he felt like, no, I want to be here. He asked for more time and during that time his reign was so bad that in the um documented as one of the kings who was not a good king but then had he gone at the time that he had been asked he had been told was appointed unto him perhaps that would not have happened so sometimes there are even things that we are asking god for that we don't need and that should not happen and he shields us from it because he knows us more than we even know ourselves. And he knows that it doesn't have to happen for us. But we sit him back because we don't know the timelines. We don't know what happens in the future. Could get fixated on it so much that it could lead to us even doubting him and like feeling like it's the end of the world for us. And... Um, another thing could be that for, um, so back to my story, for me, I, I went through a phase where for months I would go to work, go through the motions from the outside. I looked like everything was perfect to the point where one day I was speaking to one of my friends and she was like, hey, do you ever get sad? You are always happy, you dear. You don't have problems. And at that time, just that day, before I'd gone to her house, she had invited me over. It had taken like maybe five hours of mental preparation for me to finally even shower and get out of bed to go and meet her. So I felt like, oh, wow, this person is someone that I consider one like, when I talk about my closest, three closest friends, she's one of them. And that's when it dawned on me that I'm hiding so much for the people, from the people closest to me that should something happen to me the next day, or they would just be there and be like, but I never knew that this was what she was going through. And they'll be right because I was not sharing. I was keeping it all to myself and having... Um, like I'd lost appetite, I'd lost weight, I wasn't um, sleeping. So sometimes I know I have work the next day. I'm not able to fall asleep till like maybe 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. Meanwhile, I'm supposed to wake up around 5.30. So I'm just running on a very, like with very little energy because the whole night, I'm just lying in bed and I can't fall asleep and things are running through my head over and over. And this was not just a one-off thing. It was for months, maybe it had like sometimes three months, four months. And the thing is that for me, because I'd gone through the cycle over and over again at different times in my life, like I know when I'm getting there, I know when I start mentally shutting down. But the thing is, I was still fixating and it was happening and I didn't really know how to help myself. And the thing is that I didn't even really want to get help because I felt like if I speak to someone, if I go and see a psychiatrist and they tell me that, oh, she, because I knew, um, I knew that deep down the things that I was, that were making me depressed were not really supposed to. So I felt like if I go and see a, a psychiatrist and they tell me, a psychologist and they tell me that, oh, Sheila, this is what she have, then it means that that is final. They are going to diagnose you with something. And now you're going to have to live with whatever it is that they say you have. And that wasn't something that I was ready for. But I'm happy that we have a doctor today who will also be talking to us because then that person can take it from the um, psychological point of view. But then one thing that I 
know is that we are made in the image of Christ, of God, and God is a spirit. So, yes, for every sickness, there's the physical part, but there's also the spiritual aspect of it, because if God is a spirit, then it means all of us are spirits. We have bodies, we have a soul, and as much as we can do the physical part, like going through um, therapy, talking it through, there's a mental work that for me was helping me, which is also praying about it, having a support group that helps you like pray about it because there's that spiritual part that sometimes even it's just the devil who knows your assignment and has decided that I will torture this person by whispering lies into the person's ears. Um, one story that I want us to look at is the story of Elijah. The prophet Elijah declared famine on the land and for three years there was drought. It, sorry, he declared drought on the land and for three years there was no rain. And um, King Ahab and his servants, I've forgotten the servant's name unfortunately, went out to look for feed for their, um, their livestock. And when they were going, the king took one side, the servant took one side, and Elijah met the servant. And the servant told Elijah that I have hidden 70 men of God. Because Elijah told him that he was alone. He's the only prophet. And then the servant made Elijah know that, no, there are 70 men of God who I have hidden in a cave somewhere. So at that point, Elijah knew that, okay, it means I'm not alone. I'm not the only prophet doing the work of God. But then there are other people who God has also preserved so that when the time comes, they can also come out and come and do whatever work it is that they're supposed to do. Fast forward to when Elijah performed the miracle of causing down fire to come down and um, burn the, um, the offering that he made to, to God. That same day, when the people of Israel saw that he had um, called fire from heaven, something that the prophets of Baal couldn't do, 400 of them, they pursued all those prophets and killed all of them that day. Meaning that was a very big day in the life of Elijah. If it was our modern times and that happened, it's like maybe someone winning, um, like a footballer getting the balloon door or something. It was that big if you look at it. And then the same day he declared that there will be rain and rain did fall. So two miracles same day but when Jezebel mentioned to um, Jezebel sent heard about what Elijah had done to her prophet and sent a word that they should tell Elijah that tomorrow by this time as surely as she did she will pursue him and make sure he dies that little word from an evil person got Elijah down so much that he ran into a cave went to hide there and then started he got depressed and started saying stuff like um um that's um first kings 19 4 so it says but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die and said it is enough now lord take my life for i am no better than my father's so you think of it that this man just performed these big miracles that to date we still see as miracles. And this was the man who never died. He was taken up into heaven. So he's not even meant to die. But here is he saying that, come, um, it's enough, take my life. So I'm no better than my father's. So sometimes you might be doing well. You might be on track, but then some happens maybe an evil person say something or it could be anything and it just gets you down because he went into a cave he secluded himself and then thoughts came to his head and he started saying these things i want to die meanwhile this is such like and you're thinking so if even the prophet elijah 
could go through this, then it means that when we as Christians too, who are walking in the steps of Christ, we go through, we should know that it's not a sin for us to be down, but it's our, about our reaction to it in the aftermath that will tell whether we'll come out of it victorious or we will stay in it and actually um, we'll stay in it and not come out of it. And even in some cases, take our own lives when it's not the time for us to leave. And then um, um, it says that, um, I'm just reading 1 Kings 19, 5 to 8. It says, Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on the coals in a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back and the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank. And he went in, the strength of that food, 40 days and 40 nights, as far as for the mountain of God. So when he said that God didn't do anything, God just was there. He now slept. And then God brings an angel to come and minister to him. And when the angel came, the minister didn't come and say, hey, Elijah, why, why, why did you? But the minister offered him food and water. He ate, he drank, and he slept again. Then, then, sorry, the angel offered him food. Then the angel came a second time and did the same thing and even told him that arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. So I think that for me, what I get when I read this is that we don't have a father who is waiting to punish us and make us feel bad because we are depressed or we are down or God knows that sometimes we are overwhelmed and he understands us. And in times like that, he will provide for us. So anytime, if, in, if there's anyone in this call who is feeling like, I'm tired, I want to go, just relax. God will provide for you. Sometimes even, it's not about doing the great thing. What he, what he brought Elijah was food, just something for his physical body. So sometimes it's about, let's say maybe you've just given birth, you're overwhelmed, you're having postpartum depression, if you can get someone take care of your baby, maybe take care of your physical self, just a day alone, just sleeping or something just to restore yourself. Sometimes you can just have a cheat meal. Some, If you're someone who enjoys comfort food, you can just have maybe a chocolate cake, something just to refresh yourself. And I, I think that even for us, if if we have other sisters that we know are going through something, you know, one of your sisters is going through a hard time. Sometimes it's not about you being, doing the big things. Sometimes it's just about inviting the person, having lunch with the person, having a drink with the person, just being there for the person and not even addressing the issue at hand. And it helps because the person just feels just a little relief, even if it's for, just for a little time. And then it will provide that energy for the person to maybe go on a few more days or something. And um, so after God took care of Elijah's second um, um, physical needs, he was now able to journey for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb. And um, continuing, it says that there and there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of God came to him and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenants, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. But if from the previous chapters, Elijah wasn't alone because he had been told that there was someone else. But then sometimes when you are depressed, you feel like you are all alone in the world. So God didn't correct him that you are not alone, but God just left him. And even this one, God knew what was like. Obviously, he said, kill me, blah, blah. God has seen everything. But God asked him, Elijah, what's wrong? What are you doing here? And then Elijah now explains that I've been doing your work. I've been doing that. But everyone is dead and I'm alone. And sometimes when we are depressed, that's how we feel. You can have all the people in the world around you. But then in your deep inside, you feel alone. You feel like you can't talk to anyone. You feel like 
no one really understands you. And unfortunately, that makes us isolate from people. So then maybe if you used to go out with friends, you stop doing the things that you love. You start just hanging out, like just being by yourself, sleeping. Like all those are symptoms of being super depressed. Like you don't want to talk to anyone and you, uh, you keep fixating on those thoughts that you are alone, you are this, like sometimes you're feeling like I'm not enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not doing enough, I, I'm, I'm not a good um, friend, I'm not a good wife, I'm not a good mother, I'm not a good daughter, I'm not a good um, pastor, I'm not a good worker. Like all those thoughts keep going through your head. And in times like that, we should know how to at least have a few people around you, not everyone, because it's not everyone that you should be talking to about these things, because some people will only make things worse. When you tell them, oh, they'll tell you, oh, do you know what? Then they'll even give you other people's stories. By the time you finish talking to them, you were better, you would have been better off not even talking, because now you now is when you are going to really feel depressed. So, but if it's possible, let's find a few people who we can, even if it's not talking to them about what the problem is, a few people in our circles that you can even send a text message and say, hello, I'm not feeling too good. Can you pray with me? There are people like that in my life right now that I do that with. Sometimes I feel like maybe I'm having a very bad um, period of going through a few things and knowing what I've been through before, I feel like, you know what? Let me nip this in the bag. Let me not let this go far. So I call them, I tell them that because I don't, I don't want to talk. So I actually text them and I say, hey, I've not been feeling too good lately. Can you pray with me? Most of them will not even ask. They will just say, okay. And they'll pray in the spirit with me. And within like a day, two days, three days, that spirit lifts. And then I'm back to normal. And I'm like, oh, wow. So... That actually happened recently, maybe a few months ago. So it's good for all of us to have a support system that assists we can just reach out to when we are feeling a bit overwhelmed. Because these times they come, if even the men of old were experiencing it, it means that it's, it, it, we could also very easily experience it. And in the case of Elijah, it was after this that Elijah told him that he should go to a certain place and he would meet Elijah. And that is when he got a protege because at first he felt all alone. And by talking to God, God addressed those his needs by first of all, ministering to him, his physical self, and then also by giving him some companionship. And that's when God also revealed himself to him. Because if you read through it, he said that a wind passed, God was not in it. Um, there was, um, I think there was a wind, there was an earthquake, and then there was a fire. And then finally God spoke to him in a still small voice. And um, the part that God spoke to him, I'm just looking for that. It's just a minute. So God said to him, go return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. Then you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elijah, the son, Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mehola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elijah will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to bow, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So from here, we see that it's after this. Elijah saying, I'm all alone, I'm this, I'm that. Then God told him that God gave him companionship. God didn't come and shout at him that, are you not seeing the miracles I made you do? Why are you so ungrateful? So in whatever we do, let's just say that we have a father. I think I should be rounding up now. We have a father in heaven who cares about us. He cares about our physical health. He cares about our mental health. And whenever 
we are going through a period where we feel like we are all alone. If we speak to him, we call out to him, he will bring people our way. In my case, for instance, I felt like there was, there, was, there was a time that I got very depressed. Actually, that time I was having suicidal thoughts and I knew that, no, I've been through this already. That was about two years ago. I knew that I've been through this already. I promised myself previously that I am not going to harm myself. I am not going to take my life. So I knew that as much as I felt like this was the end of the world, it wasn't. And this was just a period and it would pass. So that day I was at home and I was like, no, let me, it was a Sunday. I was like, let me come to church. Cause if I don't come to church, I could end up doing something I'm not supposed to do. I came to church. I think the whole service, I don't remember what it was about because I was crying throughout the service. After the service, I went um, forward to be prayed for. And it just happened that um, I met Pastor Adeline that day. She prayed with me and Although I didn't feel okay, to, like I felt that, that, that voice went away, but then I still felt like, hmm, the problem, that one, I still didn't feel like God was talking to me or anything. So I remember that she even asked me to reach out to her the next day. She was actually checking up on me, but then during that time, I was in a very reclusive mood. So I started dodging her. Um, if she's in the call, I'm sure she's listening. But I started dodging her a little, so if she reaches out to me, I'm not because I was actually a bit shy. That uh, what was all that about on Sunday? Because you know, sometimes after having a very um, intense episode, you're like, ah, but well, that wasn't really that reaction was a bit of a. But in the moment, it felt like I really wanted to harm myself. So after that, I felt like. I still didn't really hear the voice of God, but at least that voice went away. Then I think about three months later, I was talking, it was something, I, I think I was still praying. That I used to pray and I don't hear anything, but I was still praying. And then God just started talking to me. And he told me that, do I know that during that time where I told, I kept saying he wasn't talking to me, he was talking to me all the time, but he was talking to me through one of my friends because at that time, it wasn't a voice that I needed to be hearing, but it was a physical person that I needed, someone who would be speaking to me every day if I needed a hug, the person who hugged me, someone who, who would be getting, because this, my friend, was someone I'd known like maybe 10 years or 12 years before, and just around the time that I was getting depressed, that person came back into my life, and the person became very close to me. The person would call me, have you eaten? The person would bring me food. The person would be like, oh, I, like there was a time I was even sick, the person took me to the hospital. I was thinking that's when it made sense to me that, oh, okay, so, and the person used to talk to me about God a lot. So I remember there was a time I was even talking, I told him that God doesn't love me, God doesn't talk to me anymore. And he was like, don't say that. And I kept saying, and I got upset and ranting and raving. So I remember that conversation. And then God was like, everything that that person was telling you was me telling him to tell you, but then you were becoming, you didn't want to listen because you are used to me talking to you in a certain way, like you hear that sound. So once you're not hearing my voice, any other medium that I was speaking to you, but then at that point, and I actually thought of it that at that point, if I was hearing voices, maybe it would have compounded, maybe I'll go mad or something, I'll go crazy. But then I needed an actual human being because I wasn't eating well, I wasn't taking care of myself well, I was just, so the person said that you come to my house, be like, oh, have you eaten? Okay, let's go and get food. Now I'll just sit down. I'll just be watching Netflix the whole day. He would just sit down and be watching me. So I, 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 I needed that companionship. So sometimes we might feel like God, maybe we are used to hearing God a certain way. But then if you manifest in another way, it might even be a book that someone might give you. They might be talking to you, but because you're not hearing him or you're not, you, you close yourself to it. So as we go through, um, the rest of the service let's keep all this in mind unfortunately i have to go off now but then um i'll just share some of the things that i i i i, I used to cope i've already spoken about having people around me that i can just talk to and to tell them to pray for me every time another thing is that sometimes i just play music that's uplifting sometimes the atmosphere 
the atmosphere, you have to surround yourself with things that are positive. So the time you are getting the president, the time that you should listen to more like news about this bad thing is happening here. This because I noticed that that was one of my triggers. And in the morning, I'm driving to work and I'm listening to politics, political shows. And so by the time I get to work, I filled myself up with so much negativity that I feel like the world is just bad. My life is bad. Everything is bad. So if we should limit the, the, our exposure to things that are not edifying our souls, things that are not adding to our mental um, well-being, things that make us feel down. Instead of listening to like the radio, listening to all these activities, because the thing is that the way the world is, you, bad news sells. If it's good, no one talks about it because if it's good, it doesn't really sell. So it's only the bad. The bad is always magnified in a way to sell. So you might be fixated on the bad. Meanwhile, there are good things happening that never make it to the news. So I also decided to censor my um, time that I spent on things that were bringing. So you just have to identify your triggers. If yours is maybe spending time with certain people who are always talking about the economy, it, business is no good. Maybe it's time that you back off a little bit away from them and then drew closer to people who are now talking about the positive things that can happen even when there's a recession. Because it's sometimes, if we go through the Bible, a lot of the pictures were blessed when the times were bad. It's when there's a fasting down that God lifts his people up. Because we are not an ordinary like group of people. We are special and no matter what the economic conditions are, we are, we, we, we are able to rise above it once it's the will of God. Um, I think I'll just hand over now and just sit in. And if I have to come back to answer any questions, I'll be available. Oh my goodness, now you have blessed us. I've, I've been trying to write and also load up some fantastic things that you have said. And um, God richly bless you because um, we go through bouts of depression. I think everybody has their own little bits. How quickly you get through it is, is different. But, you know, the nuggets of wisdom there, you know, self-diagnosing, you recognize some, some, some things in you, um, finding a support system around you, um, um, making sure that you play music. You know, the play music bit that you said just made me smile because it, it just points quite nicely to Isaiah 61 verse 3, you know. Um, uh, oil of gladness instead of a spirit of heaviness. Um, um, and then um, you said also choosing what you listen to and then your, your clear examples of some biblical characters. You know, I like Elijah's story so much too. So, and um, the more you said it, the more I was trying to read and, and copy and paste some of the Bible verses. But it, it, it's so true. You know, when, when you're in that dark place, you think you're alone. But God was patient with him, feeding him, sending an angel to feed him, giving him Elisha and so on. And in, in all God's goodness, he didn't even die. He was taken to heaven. I said, oh, it's amazing. <laughs> I want you to relax a bit because I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions that will come. So thank you so much. God richly bless you. I'll let um, a sister think just so that... Um, um, we, we, we enjoy what you just said, which is basically what, what song can do and how helpful sing, um, um, music is. And then we'll go to Dr. Jonathan and I'll definitely come back to you with lots of questions. God bless you, Stana. God bless you. Sister yes, Lina, yes, yes. I, oh, thank you. <laughs> Sister Lina, are you there and available to sing? Yes, please, Sister Lina. Yeah, God bless thank you. you. God bless you too. Hallelujah. God bless you, Sister S. We thank God so much for your life. God is good. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this moment in your presence. Oh, Lord God Almighty, we pray that our song of worship, Lord, uh, may it be sweet, sweet program before your mighty throne. In the mighty name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Father. You unraveled me with the melody. You surround me with a song. 
of the laborers from my enemies to love my feet I come I'm no longer a slave to be I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to be I am a child of God from my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love us called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. Thank you, Father. I'm no longer a slave to be. Thank you, Jesus. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to be. Thank you, Jesus. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to be. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to be. I am a child of God. I am surrounded, thank you, Father, by the arms of the Father. I am surrounded by sons of a believer. Thank you, Jesus. We've been liberated from our bondage. Father, we thank you. We are sons and daughters. Let us sing the freedom. Oh, 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 Thank you, that you split the sea so I can walk right through it. Father, we thank you. My fears are drawn in perfect land. You rescued me so I could stand and say, I am a child of God. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I can walk right through it. My face are drawn in perfect line. And you rescued me so I can stand and say, hey, I am. A child of God, I am a child of God. So I'm no longer a slave to be. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to be. Thank you, Jesus. I am a child of God. In Jesus' name we worship. Amen. 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 God bless you, Sister Lena. We are indeed children of God. No slave to fear. God bless you. And um, we'll, we'll hear from... Um, 
the next speaker and then plenty of questions sis. as as they come please you can send it to me um so here we go um is dr jonathan here oh yes i think i can see him but i'll just give him a minute to probably unmute before yes um, i'm i'm here i'm here oh fantastic. i'm here good evening brother good to hear your voice <laughs> Um, I'm Good just making evening. you co-host. Thank you so much Glory for for accepting to come and speak to us. Mm. We are all mm. ears and ready to hear um, your views on um, on well the psychological bits behind what happens. So thank you so much for being here. Yes, mm -hmm. it's, it's a pleasure always to be among uh, brethren and family like this. Um, greetings to every one of us and also the blessings of God beyond to us that we've actually availed ourselves for such missions like this. I call it a mission because there are a lot of people who are going through what we're going to discuss and I believe that we are tools and we are ambers of fire God will use to actually minister to other people who have been through this. So I bless you for your life. Amen. So um, when we talk about depression, it comes in different different forms. I think my sister actually laid out a very good business and even continue building up to levels that uh, I would say is quite phenomenal. And I, I bless you, my sister, for being able to self-diagnose and actually know the extent as to what you were going through. Um, I want us to be, actually be very interactive so uh, we, we would all learn more. I've been through this before. I went through such a traumatic time last year to the point I I was just about, should I say, 30 minutes from taking my own life. It was that deep because the trauma was too much and I had lost everything and I didn't know where God was. That's what I said. I don't know where God was. If God was seeing what was happening, if he still loved me, I had questions and I had doubts. Now, I want us to look at depression from this angle. Depression is when the mind can't phantom or can't understand a sudden change in its way of processing information. That is one side. It also happens when the mind gets fed up or is overfed with a routine chain of behaviors, or when the mind gets into denial. So the first is when the mind is actually overwhelmed or there's a sudden change in what it is used to. The second is when the mind uh, really doesn't know how to deal with something that has come and then when it's in denial or when it's been overfed with something continuously, like a routine, it goes on and on and on and on and the mind now begins to give up on itself. There is a chemical in the brain called cortisone. Or cortisone. Its main work is actually to temper down on the neural activity, how the, the, the mind actually sends electrical charges to each other. When one gets depressed, a couple of things happen. The neural activity, how the brain sends signal to each other, the cells, actually get dampened. So you don't get for it to work normally, or they don't send signal to each other as they're supposed to. When this happens, uh, we see a sudden change in behavior, we see a sudden change in thoughts, a sudden change in conviction. That is when it gets dangerous. In my case, I had. Um, I had gotten myself into a nasty situation and the sudden change and realization of all that was happening got me to that point where I like, oh no, I can't take this anymore. Let me just end it. Uh, God was so faithful and God helped me to actually see the love even in the midst of the storm. Um, I don't know if all of us can come online momentarily. I just want us to have a little experiment. I want us to come online. I want us all to do a certain experiment for, for, for just a few minutes. So please, when you come online, just say hi. Let me hear. I just want at least 
five to ten people to be online for such an experiment. Hi. Hi. Good, good. I want all of us to start counting from one to ten. Ready? Go. One, two, one, two, two three, 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 four, okay. five, Stop. six. Stop, seven. everybody. Now I want you to start thinking about the number, the numbers again from one to ten. Okay. Ready? Go. Now stop and mention your name. Mention yeah. your name. Ready. Okay. Do you remember where you stopped counting before you mentioned your name? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Great. But did you notice that the moment you, you mentioned your name, you placed a hold on what you were thinking? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But when you were counting it out, and I said stop, I said stop, you were immediately able to stop it at once. That is what happens when you are depressed. When you are thinking about it, it's very difficult to handle. But when you begin to speak out, so when you are depressed, one of the best things to do is to declare things, to speak out, either to speak to somebody who is spirit-filled and will understand what you are going through. Or oh, in my case, I did some healing. I use the power of imagination and conviction of the word and the conviction of the Holy Spirit that he can hear me. I will get into my room and I will say, Holy Spirit, Sit down, but your trans no one come. We have when the Bible says he has given us power in, in our mouth and in our tongue, it is actually realigning and rewiring the brain to actually accept and conform to the new order that has come into your life. So clinically, sometimes we don't tell people because they are from different uh religious background. But prayer has been known to be one of the biggest antidotes to depression. When you pray out, not in your head. Because we have the subconscious mind and we have the conscious mind. When the present happens, it happens in the subconscious mind, trying to overrule the conscious mind. That's why you see yourself imagining things and bringing things that are even past. You're trying to bring it back because the subconscious mind is trying to rule the conscious mind. Now, when you pray out loud, what you're doing is enforcing. It's enforcing the conscious mind authority and dominion over the subconscious mind. For, for you to even pray, you need to bring out of yourself and out of the conscious mind some of the words that you've read already that imprinted in your spirit or in your soul. That, that is why the Bible says that if you are weak on the day of adversity, then you are weak indeed. For if the word is not in you and we say uh, you're supposed to pray, I, then what are you going to pull the word from what I'm going to put it out from depression, my sisters and my brothers here. It is not a joke, it can happen to any of us. It happens every but as my sister said, Oh, Africa, you know, our traditions and even our Christian people tell how oh, you say, Oh, I'm fine, but deep down, you're lost. We are meant to, we, we actually. Uh, put on makeup, we put on things that will actually show externally that we are okay. But deep down, most of us are broken pieces. My sister also said something about Elijah going to the Jennifer tree and telling God, oh God, you know, I am tired, kill me. Yes. What he did was actually one of the ways to deal with depression and most the, the sure way, what he was doing was complaining to God. And as he spoke, God now fed him. God now fed him. God now fed him. How will God feed you <laughs> with the word? With assurance. It is not just a theological thing we are talking about. It is real. The more you talk about it to God, the more you speak out, it dampens the thoughts that comes. Clinically, we've observed something. People who are in a negative state, 
are open to any suggestion, be it from good or evil. That's why suicide becomes an option because at that time, the body just doesn't want to go through that state of confusion and being lost. So suicide becomes an option, but we Christians know it's a whisper of the evil one. And mostly it works when you are that down. So if there's word in you, and if the foundation is that weak, uh, <laughs> Seaside looks so palatable. It's just like a plate of goodies set for you. But that is not the way. One, talk about it with God. There's one also that I observed. Depression normally happens to people who think they are self-sufficient. Depression normally happens to people who feel they are self-sufficient. Oh, I am this. Oh, I am that. I know I am this. I know I can do this. The moment you get into that posture in life, depression is actually right at your doorstep. Because the moment things that you think you are shift a bit, you feel lost. But those who trust in God, those who are like, okay, look, I can't do anything. It is God who takes care of me. The mind, the body has that conviction. The mind has that conviction. The moment the person comes, it runs back to, okay, after all, I'm not the one who does anything. There is somebody superior who does everything for me. That one becomes a strong tower. That is why when we did a survey throughout the world, Christians are likely to get out of depression faster than any other known group of people. It's a phenomenon. Christians tend to get out of depression faster than any group of people because there's always an uncle. But people who are self-sufficient, they feel they went to bed on the high on top of the world, they woke up with the world on top of them. So the depression comes because the mind cannot accept that I have to rely on somebody else. That's one of them, one of the things. Things like singing, things like praying, especially in tongues, because it's been known and it's a fact that when you pray in tongues, the neural endings fire, the mind actually gets busy and you get the, mass, the, the mind working almost at 60% on a normal day. Now, when you are depressed, as you pray more and as you are blowing in tongues, number one, there's oxygen saturation in your blood goes up. It brings more oxygen into your system because you are talking fast, you are breathing faster, and then it elevates that. There's also uh, some enzymes in you that we call happy hormones. They're actually in the brain. That also get triggered when you are praying in tongues. It breaks down emotional barriers in the brain and actually resets the brain all over. So praying in tongues is also one of the best things. As I said, prayer is. Praying in tongues is an, an, another level of it. Declaration. And then talking to yourself. This is what you do. God has placed himself in us. It's actually not just spiritual, it's actually physical. There is this healing that when you're looking at yourself in the mirror and you're talking to yourself, the mind tends to grab it faster than you talking to a counselor. So get a mirror in the morning or in the evening and talk to yourself. Encourage yourself. And as you do so, the brain sees it as a familiar person than any other. And then the body now tries to readjust itself. So talking to yourself is one. There's a myth about depression that I want us to, um, I want us to actually debunk, then we move, we move on. Crying at the initial state of depression is good, but when it carries on, it pushes the mind and the body into a posture of self-pity. And that's your most vulnerable point. Self-pity should not be condoned. Hello? The way you are in self-pity, it opens you up for suggestions from any angle. Any and every angle. Self-pity is a no-no. 
Now, the moment you have that in mind that, look, I cannot beat myself. Let me talk to myself. You cancel yourself. You talk, you talk to yourself. Getting up in your most holy faith also comes by you talking to yourself. You know yourself more than the counselor. You know yourself more than the third party that you're going to talk to. Talk to yourself. Look yourself straight in the eye and talk to yourself. Simple words. Like, you will be fine. God has got us. We will be fine. Now, the moment you start doing that, the brain now grabs it and uses it to your advantage. We will be fine. We may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Even Jesus went through depression. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, the bleeding of blood was the highest point of depression and stress. It means the arteries were burst and the blood was coming through the, 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 the sweat pores. Jesus was dead already at that point. But look at what he was doing. He prayed and asked the Father to strengthen him. Jesus prayed. And we also need to get to that posture. It gets to a time, those who have been through this, you feel your heart is racing and sweating. They are all the stress hormones in you going up. The best thing to do at that time is to, is to sit, close your eye, and have this breathing pattern. One, two, three, four, five, six. You count in twos, and after every third one, there should be a break. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, and after every two there's a pause where you breathe in well what you are doing is actually controlling your pulse controlling the amount of blood that is going into your head that gives you clarity that gives you clarity for you to think and to know the next step one of the dawns of depression is trying to mask it with alcohol or things like phone distracting yourself. See the person as this. It is a storm that you can't you can't outrun, but you have to go through to the other side. When you try to distract yourself, you are going in circles in the middle of the storm, and you will not come out of it. Alcohol, using movies doing this, doing this, and not facing the reality and asking for strength from above is going around in the storm. You find yourself in it even after two years. You need to face the reality of the change. You need to face the reality of what you are going through. No denial. But then you go through it and you can't do it alone. That's why you need prayer. That's why you need Christ. That's why you need your declarations. Let's look at another character in the Bible. The book of Job talks about depression and how to handle it. When it started, he cried. Then what did he do? He went to God. He went to God. And then people around him came. Some were encouraging at first. Some were deflating. That's why you can't get into self-pity because at its weakest point, that was when the deceivers came. You, you get people around you who had a more fire flame. You must know where you must go. And the answer is God. When Job was at asking God questions, frustrations, Guess what? It's for him. Because God's answers were like massage to his brain. It assured him that God is still in the boat with him. The assurance is very much needed. Music is also one of the biggest breakthroughs when it comes to depression. Sometimes it just can't, it, it's not just even the song as it is. It, look, it's not any other song. It's not any other song. Songs that are soothing to the mind. Songs that will speak to your spirit. 
Because believe it or not, I'm a doctor, so I'm not going to be a, so, but I'm not going to be all spiritual about um all clinical about this. Look, the spiritual side of depression that we the scientists don't even understand. We don't get it, and it can only be spiritual. So this is when you need to get up and go to your strong tower. That is cry. Some people come and you do a, a, a prognosis. You do everything and you see that there's nothing in there to let them be depressed. But they are. But they are. Everything is okay with them. Their life is good. Their marriage is good. They have money. They have family who love them. They have everything. <laughs> But guess what? They are the most miserable people. And that one is, we, sometimes we term, we term it uh, depression of unknown origin. We tell it still, we don't know. <laughs> we, 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 we don't know where it's coming from. But the truth of the matter is, it's emptiness. And we know it's emptiness. Only we cannot put it on paper that patient came in due to emptiness, which has caused depression. So we tell you, oh, we'll work on it. And then we'll give you medicines or things that will actually bring a bit of joy in the brain, the chemical formulation of the brain. But a strong tower is Christ. And music has been known to help. Also, we also advise people to get in touch with nature. Move out of your place. Go and get in touch with nature, where you actually begin to take notice of things around you, like flowers, like birds, they actually go a long way to help. Please, is there is there any question? Please um, let the questions come. I, I mostly like it like this when we, uh, we we quite interact. Hello, brother Jonathan. Honestly, I'm I'm writing, but I think I have to go and listen to this thing again because it's just been <laughs> fantastic, sisters. If you've got any questions do feel free to um, put your hand up and, and speak. But Brother Jonathan, you've given us a lot to think about right here. And, you know, talk to God about it. Um, um, how to, to declare things, it. talking to yourself. It's just fantastic. Let me just check. Exactly. Um, Sister Lena wants to ask something. Lena, go for it. Thank so. you. Uh, this is so interesting. Um, Dr. Jonathan, I just wanted to ask you, What's the difference yeah. between um, depression and PTSD? Mm. Please. Okay, um, so PTSD is, uh, is categorized along um, deep onset of, of depression. With PTSD, it's more long lasting. With PTSD, the brain has now registered the trauma as part of it, and it's actually struggling to get, get rid of it. So it has become something that is there to stay. Now the treatment for PTSD mostly is how to configure the mind again to actually let that, that uh, situation be minimal. I don't know if I'm, I'm making sense with that. But as you know, PTSD mostly happens to people who have gone through the worst of them all. And the brain now keeps replaying it as a loop from the subconscious mind to the conscious mind, you fight it. So PTSD is not something that we deal with once. It's actually a process until the, pers the person, I don't want to use the word patient, the person now comes to a, a point that he said, okay, this happened, but I'm not going to let it control me. This happened and it cannot let it control me because PTSD is more controlling. It takes hold of you and then moves you to be either violent, to be withdrawn. But when it comes to depression, you have some form of control where you move in and out. PTSD is like <laughs> the, 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 the horror movie is playing to you every now and then. Sounds trigger them, light triggers them, statements trigger them, some words trigger them, some clothes, it, 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 it's, it's the worst of them all. So it's a deep set form of depression that, that is not easy to deal with. I hope I was able to answer that. Um, I see our sister Fiona. Yes, you um, have. Thank you. You're welcome. Sister Fiona. Hello, Dr. Jonathan. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed yeah. your delivery and I like the very practical aspect of it. Thank you. Um, I have a question and this has been lingering on my mind since I found out some, I think a couple of years ago. There's this um, pastor 
of one of the mega churches okay. in California, Jared Wilson. And he killed himself. Okay. And this was a person okay. who was an, an advocate for um, well, uh, suicide, or like, let's say he was against suicide. So he was actually, what he was doing a lot was working with a lot of these younger people who were suicidal. And apparently the day he killed himself, he had just officiated a service for one of the people he had been helping who finally gave up and killed herself. So that's, that may have triggered something in him as well, they say. But what, what beat my yes. mind is, this is somebody who knows God. This is somebody who pastors a church. This is somebody who was advocating against suicide, but ended up submitting to it himself. What could have gone wrong in that instance? Mm. Yeah. Yes. Um, let me give you <laughs> just a quick question. Have you seen some paper or glass at work before? the one we used to smoothing wood and all. Do you see that they are actually in their worst state after the work is done? The furniture will look nice, but the, the glass for the sandpaper looks worse. What we actually don't see is that people who actually cancel mostly need can, can, counseling themselves. I, I know about that story now. Uh, further investigation showed that he was dealing with something that uh, he thought he had totally overcome. But when he met up with it again, he was overwhelmed. This brings me to a very, very crucial point of our talk. You don't need to sweep the person under the carpet. Deal with it. Face it. That's why I said, go through it. Don't go around in the storm thinking you are okay. Deal with it. Face it to the point that you can even talk about it without it getting you down. That is when you can begin to claim victory over it. The moment you go through a situation and you can't talk about it, that is a problem. So I'm not surprised the Bible said, and we overcame by the blood and by the word of testimony. Some of the testimonies are what you went through, as we are doing now. So I don't know what happened with him, but it is likely that he had masked it or had pushed it aside and had moved on. So when he was made a reality of it, it became overwhelming. It happens to a lot of us. Another, another information, most doctors hate medicines. I'm one of them, I know. That's how it is. So mostly when you, are, when you are confronted with them, go through it. Don't use the shortcut way of ignoring it. Oh, I just brush it and I move on. No, we don't do that. It will come back again. You face it, you accept, don't be in denial. You pray through it, you declare against it, you counsel yourself, you seek help if you need. But don't be reliant on the help that is coming. The help is from within, from God who is inside you. If you're able to deal with it to the point that you can talk about it, you can say it, that is when you can claim victory over it. Thank you. I hope I've also been able to answer that. Um, any other question? Then I want to move to a, a, another zone of, of depression that we need to actually talk about. I want to talk about depression in children. Mostly, when we are going through issues, we think that children all go through such issues. There are some symptoms you can actually recognize. When your child starts wetting the bed, all of a sudden is getting defiant, seem to be drifting off. You now need to start assessing the home, which is the first point of depression. Is everything okay between the period and the parents? Because the children get to see a lot than we think they do. When there's a change in their diet, they don't seem to enjoy the company of the family sitting. There are normal things or like watching television or coming to bother you, the mother or the father, is now become is becoming something that is not continuous. They rather prefer to be in their room to play games or in my case, 
my when my child says, I, I want to be alone, I want to do my homework, and there's a problem because we always have to fight before she does it. So those are some of the of the signs, and we need to really, really pay attention. If the home is cleared, the next level is the school. Are they being bullied in school? school is a teacher threatening them look some of the teachers um <laughs> not probably uh intentionally become bullies to our children those of us who went to the typical Ghanaian schools you know how friend teachers were a friend teacher was giving me nightmare i wasn't still in the school i didn't want to go to school every time i have to go to school my heart is in, is, is in my pants um, my heart is racing and it got to time i was getting depressed so i, I, I wouldn't uh, my performance was even coming down it is good that once in a while we sit with our children and then we actually get in touch. We should be very observant. We shouldn't be distracted. Suicide in children is getting higher and higher every day because it doesn't make the news, so we don't know. Most of the kids are dying inside and it builds bitterness and they grow up and they get to be the worst of people. Be your own doctor in your house. Observe. Observe. Talk to them. When a child can't answer you by looking straight into your eyes again, there is a problem. Get to the bottom of it. When they begin to hide some things, get to the bottom of it. Find out how they are doing in school. Find their joys. Find it. Hello. Now, all of us also, we have a juniper tree. When Elijah was depressed, he ran to the wilderness and was was lying under the juniper tree in 17. After cursing the land that there will not be any rain, he went to a brook and God was using ravens to feed him. But when he was at his wit's end, he went to his juniper tree. That is a stronghold, his joy, something that gives him joy. And there, God fed him. We all need to build an altar of something that gives you joy. The some part that some of us use material altars. Some of us use material altars. My job, my husband, oh, media Netflix, oh, media is chatting. Look, those are fiscal altars. They will crumble and they are the first thing depression takes out. But there is an altar that cannot be broken. There is a joy that cannot be taken away. That is why Christians get healed faster. That joy is the Lord Jesus. If he gives you joy in the midst of depression, you go to a juniper tree, who is Christ. That is where your joy will be sustained and it will be restored. If your joy is in your husband, he can be the number one cause of your depression. If it's in your job, the moment you lose that job, that's why I said people who think they're self-reliant always get depressed. If it's in your job, you can lose that job. If it's a business, look at the economy, it can crumble. If it is money, phew, Yes, it's come from PDD. <laughs> Forgive me, I'm just trying to put some humor there. But if your altar of joy, your juniper tree is something physical, oh, you are cousins with depression. Oh, if your juniper tree is something material, oh, depression is your cousin because the moment it goes away, you are like a ship without a compass. <laughs> yes, it's significant bit in this. Alina, yes, money doesn't like noise. <laughs> then you tell me in Ghana now. So that is it. Again, what brings joy in the house that your children cannot miss? What is the joy? Is the joy you, the mother? If you're not there, what happens? Is the joy their father? If it's not there, what happens? Let's plant a juniper tree of Christ in the house. Hallelujah. So I'm not saying it will happen, but we will not live forever. What happens if Christ decides to call us right now? What will our children do? Would they be? Be able to stand? Or you have their God and their everything. So without you, the house of Christ. This. I don't know why I'm saying it, but I think it's the Holy Spirit talking to all of us. Don't be the center of your children's world. Let Christ be the center of your children's world and of your home. In our current language, when one
So let us not be the joy. Let Christ be the joy in the house. Please, um, is there are there any other questions so that we move on? And I hope we are learning also. <laughs> Dr. Jonathan, we are learning plenty, plenty. Um, sisters are quiet. When they are quiet like this, that means they are being fed. Sisters, if you've got questions, because Jonathan, <laughs> Dr. Jonathan really, really thrives on on questions being asked so that it will it will it will it will get the whole thing interactive. He he, he has already said that. So if you've got any questions, oh, two hands are up. Um, Sister Fiona and then Sister Hannah, please. Mm. Fiona, uh, or maybe your yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that was me. I, yeah. I'm asking because I'm really enjoying the session. So, yes. Dr. Jonathan, sure. it what yes. you raised about the children is so important mm. because I think we tend to overlook some of the behaviors mm. of the children, which may be bordering on depression. Exactly. No wonder there are lots of um, young mm -hmm. adults, young ones committing suicide. Um, I just wanted to. Ask, exactly give you some symptoms so that you can yeah. tell me whether because there's there's this kid he doesn't interact mm -hmm. very much very closed um mm -hmm. doesn't doesn't like school and um mm -hmm. it is really that seems to be not bothered about anything doesn't want to interact mm -hmm. with anyone socially withdrawn to himself mm -hmm. even in school um doesn't really want anyone mm -hmm. to know his private life, what happens with him at home, whether he's got siblings mm. or not, does he want his birthday to be celebrated? Mm. He's just totally withdrawn, you know, and um, okay. this is something I've observed, and for me, um, even though the, the, the kid mm. is not my child, I'm trying to um, mm. hint to the mother, you, you need to start looking at this before the child goes, you know, yeah. Yes. I, I think they are alarm yes. bells, but I don't know, as a doctor, these things that I've mentioned, do you think, do you see any signs in there? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because for a, a, a child, it's either we have the, the children who actually observe and enjoy observing, where other kids are playing. Although they are not playing, they sit there and observe. But when a child now tries to cut all lengths of any of the playing, and it's in the corner, and it's having a straight face, no emotions, that is a red flag, and the family, the family needs to be alerted to get into his business. Such kids, you know, in Europe and in the States, those are the kids who can actually prepare bombs in their rooms. They have a world of their own, and when depression sets in, as I said, they get to that poor mean state, any suggestion goes. And the enemy looks out for children like that. So it's a quite a good observation of us to actually see that because it's not normal for a child to see other children and try not to communicate with anybody, but we were drawn. If it is once in a while that he gets into the crowd and then moves out, that is different. But if he's always like that, that is a red flag. And we need to call the parents' attention to it. This doctor, second one, what do you recommend in such a situation? Should you know, usually when you say that to a parent, it's as if you are telling them that their kid has mental mm. issues. So, how do you go about it? You see, should they go and see a psychiatrist? Oh, okay. Yeah. A, a okay. Psychologist will do, not a psychiatrist. A, a okay. child psychologist to do who would do more observation and see the pattern. Also, um, there are some tests that can be done. Um Later on, we can get in touch and then let's see how we can help such a child. There are some tests that can be done to actually see if he has any of the underlying uh, childhood suppressive uh, behavioral uh, diseases. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'll be in touch, please. Thank you. Fantastic. I'm sure I saw another hand up and um, maybe the sister will come back again. again. Yeah, yeah, oh, Sister Hannah, there you are. Yeah. Hi, Sister Hannah. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> I apologize to my boys. I'm in the choir and the parental impact. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Jonathan. Uh, Sister Fiona answered my second question because I wanted to ask how does, how do you um, talk to identify someone, especially like a parent, if um, mm. someone is so, Anyway, you, you kind of answered that. But I guess the other statement maybe I wanted to add is, wow, thank you so much for helping me put context. Um, you mentioned something like if you, like I've always been a Christian, but um, I think my control or my, my stability was a bit 
unbalanced during 2020. And you mentioned mm-hmm. something like if you are someone who um, is like an independent woman or a person, and then exactly. there's a big change, then I guess you could get depressed. Obviously, the COVID really impacted me because it impacted my exactly. business and it impacts my money. I had mm-hmm. no control. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, I, I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do, but obviously, yes, just like you said, when you have, when um, eventually it happened, a, how many years? A year and a half after COVID to really yeah. stop blaming whatever it was, the government mm. or God, whatever, and then focus mm-hmm. on um, like working on purpose, like in my purpose, mm. so my destiny purpose. So I, I just didn't know how, I just didn't understand what was happening to me, but I like how you connected it. Um, I don't know whether you can just delve a, deep, a bit more on that, how you connected like an independent woman or whatever, and then something transforming yes. that. So, um, yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy I'm making impact here. So there is this, you see, there's a difference between being independent and self-sufficient and walking in the purpose of God and fulfilling your destiny. Those are two different things. Sometimes we end up chasing what we think we will build without connecting it to what God wants us to do. So in the end, we don't find fulfillment. We are trying to survive, but not walking in our destiny. So. I like what you said. After COVID hit and everything seemed to be shaky, those were the platforms or altars you had built. And when it was being taken away, you acted humanly where your mind was going to that. But then if it was God giving purpose or what you were doing was fully connected to God's purpose, even when it starts shaking, because you know it is his purpose, you don't get that affected. You are human, you get affected somehow, but then it doesn't get fully shaken as it, it would be because you know, hey, after all, I, I'm not the one providing, I'm not the one moving this thing. It is to the glory of God. So if it goes, if the if it goes up and it's for his glory, let it go to him. If it comes to shame, he should also take it because the one who takes the glory must also take the shame. And that is when God actually acts. So and I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not trying to water laziness in us, but whatever you do should be to the glory of the Father. And in that, his name will be glorified and you will be fulfilled. I hope I've been able to add some to it. So that's God what I mean you. by that. Thank you very much. God bless you. You know, after Stafina asked her question, it brought to mind yes. um, 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 how Ghana can help um, um, children in schools because when COVID hit, hit us here, um, there was a huge mm-hmm. problem with um, um, children being having mental issues. And my school currently has yes. employed five people, three counselors, two nurses, mm-hmm. just to counsel mm-hmm. children. And um, as part of year teams, we now have three people looking after each year group just to make sure there's somebody to talk to them, somebody to listen to them because um, locking people up caused all sorts of issues for them. And um, with Fiona describing these things, it just came to mind, you know, um, we've got counselors at church, we've got parents who are counselors, is this something that maybe schools can can be encouraged to do for because most that, people that are, you know where we are. Mm, mm. Mm-hmm. Go go for it, Doctor Jonathan. Yes, mm. yes, and that's the problem we have here. Mm. Um, we, we've actually uh, painted some some areas as grey. We don't go there. The moment you told, oh, go and see a psychologist. Immediately <laughs> we write down, okay, so the person is losing the mind. Psychiatry is a no go area but we are supposed to have them in the school. Every school is supposed to have a psychologist Mm -hmm. or somebody who is a good counselor that can actually reach out to the kids. And that that person should be active, should not be just in the office and just the kids coming to. It should be an all-rounder who goes from class to class and is loved by everybody that is approachable. Mm -hmm. That, That is what we need to do. But we don't have it here. The next best thing we have is to have spirit filled people of the anointing of God to be around. 
Mm-hmm. Teachers should get out of their spirits in Christ and let the Holy Spirit use them. Because for now, uh, with our education system, GS, I don't think, has any plan of employing psychologists into any school. That's a fact. <laughs> but after COVID, there's been so much damage caused to most of the kids. Substance mm-hmm. abuse is on the rise, theft is on the rise. It's all, it can all be traced to the lockdown. After the lockdown, there was a, a, about a, a 200% rise in, in, in suicide in teenagers. Yes. So uh, as you said, it's actually a very good thing that we need to do. It is. Because a lot of um, a lot of people go to fee paying schools, so they can lobby the schools yeah. because they pay for it after all. Exactly. It's, it's something something exactly. maybe people can think about. Yeah. Um, but uh, yes. you know, um, you you have so so nicely supported our first speaker, um, um, sister sister Na, because um, you yeah. have just shown us both the 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 scientific background. And then you have supported mm-hmm. her biblical backgrounds. You use exactly yes. the same examples: Elijah, Juniper Tree, yeah. Jesus. Initially, when she was talking, I started putting the Jesus story up, and then I I took it down because mm-hmm. um, she didn't mention it. But um, I had it I had it already pasted in the chat, and then I mm-hmm. took it off. But you're right, Jesus sweating blood. He 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 felt everything mm-hmm. he had felt you know, um, and, and, and mm. still was able to survive. It was interesting that he kept going back to, to the disciples and, and, and mm. encouraging them to pray for him. Like, um, as if, uh, you, are, mm-hmm. you are my support system. Come on, help me here. And, and they just mm-hmm. kept sleeping. And um, <laughs> it's like you have suggested, mm-hmm. having a good support system is also a very, a very important point. Um, today is not about me, yeah. so I don't want to share too much. I, I just want you to keep going with some great stuff. Is there anybody who sure. wants to ask it, um, Dr. Yeah. Jonathan a question at all? Because it's been a fantastic session, actually. Um, anybody? Um, I'm okay. just looking. Okay, let, let, me, let me add this probably to trigger a question. Okay. I want us to look at two characters who dealt with depression differently. I'm talking about Peter and Judas. Their situations were not different, but their outcome were different. Now, there is one aspect of our Christian faith that actually works even medically. Owning your mistakes, owning your faults. The moment you begin to fight against something which is deep-rooted, that your mind has already registered that, look, this one, you are wrong. Therefore, you need to accept it and you fight against it and not test to guilt. As Christians, we have is repentance. It is one of the biggest antidotes to depression. Peter, after denying Jesus Christ openly, <laughs> This was big, big and bigger than what Judas did because he had declared his love for Christ openly and denied him openly. Judas, at least, it was among the, the disciples that they knew that he was the one who sold him out. But look at what happened. He made Jill like an anchor and it drowned him. So he took what he thought was the easiest way out. Peter called back, went into repentance, and came out stronger. I don't know whom this is for, but what you are going through, assess yourself also. The point you know you are wrong, come to Christ with repentance. When he takes it away, guilt goes away. When guilt goes, 95% of depression is solved. The rest is just touches. And we've spoken about them. But when you are in denial, your heart knows when you are wrong. Your mind, subconscious mind knows when you are wrong. But the conscious mind always tells you you are right. That's where ego comes in. You don't say, just don't want to accept that you are wrong. That is a seed for depression to grow. That is 
the seed for depression to grow. So owning your mistakes helps. Um, I'm trying to please, abuse I, I myself at the it. same time, and 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 yes, you're right. Um, owning, 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 owning your mistakes helps. We do that in school all the time, you know. When a child, so what did you do wrong? And if they are able to actually admit what they did wrong, then you can help them. But mm -hmm. if they don't, exactly, you're not, you're not getting anywhere. Basically, yes. <laughs> exactly. And Mr. Hannah exactly. wants to ask a question again. Hannah. The floor Thank is yours. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was very deep. Can yes. you? Um, in your in your history or your time as a doctor, um, depression and divorce. Um, <laughs> I don't. Is there a link? Because I don't know why that came to mind. So I'm not. I'm not even married yet. But is there a link? Because I just feel like when you said owning your mistakes, I'm even looking at right now in the state of Ghana. I know people are not from here, and mm. what we're going through with our leadership. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm sure they're quite mm, impressed. Exactly. When you give us uh, depression and divorce and depression, and I guess people of in high positions or is it leadership? Because you heard, I'm not. I'm sure you heard. Um, in America, this big CEO of a Fortune 500 company literally jumped off the balcony of his yes. um, in New York. So yes. I'm just trying to correlate those yes. two. I know they're two different things, but if you can give examples, thank you. Great. Yes. They, 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 they're actually not that different. Um, so let me take from the divorce state. You see, don't build your world again. Mm -hmm. I, it keeps coming to me. Don't build your world around your marriage. Build your world around Christ, who is the holder of the marriage. I take it again. Don't build your world around the marriage. Build your world around Christ, who is the holder of the marriage. I was married for, for 10 years, I think we're entering our living here. And there's one thing I've seen. Look, one day I will share my story here. I was the worst husband anybody could have on earth. I was good though, but there was a lot of bad. Now, somehow, somehow I had seen how powerful I was to my family, to my wife, and to my kids. And power can get us drunk, men especially. It got me drunk, and I was just doing anything because I knew I was God in the house. Until so God, he said, hey, Jonathan, you're being like, like in the book at Neza, calm down. And he did his own thing. I was, um, okay, Sister, Sister Hannah said, <laughs> oh, okay. Sister Hannah says I should share my story. Well, um, I was a breadwinner of the family. I, I think I was like a star doctor. I was um, everything a man, man would want. I'm six, I'm six foot two. I'm not overly handsome, but I'm okay. <laughs> That's what I see. And people would come to me and people admired me and all. And I was basking in that. Mm -hmm. You know, I devalued my own marriage. I would come home. I would just walk on my wife. I became a chronic womanizer. That was, it was stinky. Until God in his own mercy and his own wisdom brought me down. When I, I lost everything. And when I lost everything, it was that woman that I was walking upon who stood up as a prayer tower and drew me out of depression and drew me out of that filthy life and helped me be established in Christ again. Now I'm holding the torch in my house and I am the fire blazer. That is my testimony. So back to this. When a marriage crumbles, mostly, mostly, uh, men, we don't show that kind of emotional weakness. So people think men don't get uh, affected by divorce. We just put on a strong face. That's why you will see a man start chasing other women and drinking. That is how we are dealing with the depression. It is real, amen. When a woman gets depressed, a woman can talk to another person and we say, oh, it's okay. Your woman is good to go through. When a man goes through depression, he can't talk to anybody. Because when you do, hey, a man does not that. A man does not cry. A man... So men get very depressed. Now, a woman, and I said, Hannah, I'm, I'm saying this straight to you uh, and to uh, those of us who are married. When a woman builds his world around a man, 
that he becomes the source of income, the source of joy, the source of his life, the source of everything, and it is taken away. That is when it comes like PTSD. It hits you because you feel the world has been destroyed. But if your joy and your hope is in Christ, who gave you the man? If the man leaves, Christ does not leave. Christ is, is still there. It comes back to purpose. Recognizing that you are not self-sufficient, but it is Christ who has even given you the marriage. When the marriage is not there, Christ is still there. He's still your sustainer. He's still the one who established you. So yes, depression in marriage is real. It's not even during divorce. Inside marriage, some people are tyrants. They come home and even the cat in the house wants to hide. People are going through depression. They put on makeup, come out, sing, and smile. But back at home, they are living with Adolf Hitler. And they go through quite a lot. So yes, right after divorce, these are some of the things that... No, 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 no. I, I hope we have our pen. And papers. We don't just mend the broken pieces. If mine, they don't end up in, in divorce. Don't do this after divorce. Don't try to bring out the bad in the person you divorced to others. It gets you more divorced. It gets you more depressed. The more you talk evil about him, that evil you are talking about become pillars and solidify in you. It gets you depressed. Rather, the little good he did when you talk about it heals you. Don't keep account of his past wrongs and memorize them for you to have a good story that people will sympathize with you. Because the moment, as it will come back to it, you, you understand. The moment you begin to talk evil about him, for people to sympathize with you, you move to the poor me and the pity self, self-pity. And that, as we've already spoken about, is a doorway to high-level depression. Try to find yourself again. Find yourself again. The self that was before you got married, develop and grew to be who you are now and appreciate God for it. Looking up to Christ, let you not look at the crisis. Looking up to Christ does not allow you to look at the crisis. So look at how far God has brought you and that will let you be appreciative even of the man or the woman that you think has left you because no matter what they might have made one impact so dwell on the good not on the evil that they did don't dwell on the dark Direct dwell on the light these are the major and the basic things you need to actually look at if you get yourself into that situation now, about the CEOs and the, and the, and the leaders that are taking their life. Uh, when you are a leader, like in the situation that you talked about in New York, and the ships are going down, and everybody is looking up to you, <laughs> it is not an easy feat. Because then, they are, your, your level of responsibility gets so high. And at that point, it's no more even about you, but about what people are going through because of you. And it comes again to the Judah scenario where he felt guilt. So it was guilt that actually pushed a man to take his life. He felt he had messed up. He felt he was the cause of other people's pain. That was what happened to Judah. He felt he had messed up. He had caused Christ pain. And that is the anchor I, I, I said, I talked about earlier, that can drown you. When guilt comes in, the person gets suicidal. So we don't need to actually entertain that. We don't need to actually entertain that. So dwell more on the positives, not on the negatives. If you are a leader and you are going through such states that you are feeling the guilt, mm, don't try to be a superhero. Don't shield everything by yourself. God always bring pillars that will actually help us 
whilst the person now tends to be a caterpillar that wants to bring our pillars down. So that's what we ask that God will always give us pillars that will help us to carry the load of responsibility and set away guilt so that we can stand. So please, um, that, that, that is my delivery so far. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's take a couple of questions and then we, we move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, the two characters are really helpful, Judas and also Peter. And um, Stana says thank you, but Judas and Peter. And um, mm. I guess how you handle whatever you go through is really important. I think mm. you've given us um, a, a topic that uh, we, we might have to dig into, which is um, what, what um, depression through, through, through divorce can do to a person. But um, it, it, was, it was amazing advice. I have, I have picked a lot from it. In fact, I sent somebody a private message. I don't think they've seen it, but um, God, God is amazing. You won't believe it. It's five past 10, Dr. Jonathan. And sister, oh. nah. between the two of you, I'm, I'm sitting here going, I wish it was the beginning and we are now starting at eight o'clock because <laughs> I, mm. I don't want it to end. But um, um, if anybody has one last question, we will take one last question and then we will spend some time praying for these um, two fantastic people. Um, I have a feeling we'll call upon you again, Dr. Jonathan, at some point. And sister, sure. nah, God bless you. Anybody got one last question or something? Otherwise, I will I will call on somebody to pray for both of them. Let's see. I keep scrolling and then, okay, I can't see anything. I I think you fed us. You fed us, pa. So um, I will I will ask Sister Fiona if you are able to unmute to pray because um, I know you are there listening big time to pray for um, Brother Jonathan, and then I'll, I'll find, um, let's see who my next um, lovely person would be to pray for S Sister Na. Um, Lena, if you are available to pray for Sister Na for us, okay, and then, um, and then we'll find somebody to summarize the prayers. Safiana, are you able? Salona, I, I was asking if we could, if we wanted to see him or somebody wanted to see him. Yes, I said- oh, we can do that behind the scenes. I was All right, okay, that's I fine. I a reply. I sent okay. my message. Right, and, oh, okay. Dr. Jonathan, I sent you some direct messages. And um, yeah, let me see. Hey, is, uh, is Pastor Adeline to hear? There are so so many people. It's just that everybody has been so quiet. Um, Pastor Adeline, <laughs> when we finish, can you seal us okay. all completely in prayer as well, please? I can't see her. Oh, she has, she's there. So, um, Safina, if you pray for um, um, Dr. Jonathan, and Dr. Jonathan, I sent you a message about a contact number so we can, or, or address or email address or something. So if you can reply to me directly and then. Yes. Thank sure. you. Sure. And then, yes. and then um, um, Sister Lena, if you can pray for, um, whoever I asked you, and then Pastor Adline will close us in prayer. Thank you. Hmm. Amen. Shall we pray? Dr. Jonathan, God bless you so much for blessing mm. us. It's been, it's been such an insightful so, session. So and um, maybe we'll have a part two another time. We'll I think of something that. else that will pull you back here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Father, in the name of <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so shall we pray and bless our brother. Father, we thank you so much. Mm. We thank you for what has been shared here today. We thank you because we know that you purpose for this to happen. We blend so much and we are grateful that you sent vessels. Father God, at the time that they may have been going through what they were going through, they had no idea that you were preparing them for a ministry to, for others that will come. We are grateful for our brother, Dr. Jonathan. Lord, would you bless the work of his hands? Would you bless his ministry? Father God, would you bless any, any, anyone who comes to see him? Let him be a blessing to millions. Let him heal homes. Let him heal hearts. Let him heal minds. Father God, we pray that he never lacks. We pray that you put a guard of protection around his home and his family and whatever it is that he's he's spent on us this evening, his time and his efforts, Father, his wisdom that he's given to us so freely. 
Father God, even the way he shared your word and connected it so beautifully with his profession. And Father, the way you've helped us to understand it, we are so grateful. We are thankful for his life and we are praying for more oil upon his head. We're praying that Father God, you give him life, more life, bless him abundantly, that anything that he's given here, Father, you multiply a hundredfold and reward him with this. And Lord, we pray that you grant him utterance wherever he goes and may your spirit lead him so that even as he's talking, like he did with us tonight, it will be your spirit that is speaking, healing hearts and homes. And Father, from here, we pray that you continue to watch over him and his family, all to your glory. Thank you so much for the life of our sister too. We thank you for how far you brought her and we know that there are more victories inside for her. Lord, will you continue to watch over her and grant her peace? I'll hand over to Sister Lena. Thank you, Lord, for answering prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, we Amen. thank you so much for Sister Na. We bless you for her life. Father, we thank you that this has been her first major platform to be able to come out and speak about her own personal um, um, journey with depression. Father, how much she has blessed the lot of us today. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus for strength for Sister Na. Continue to give her more and more victories. Continue to give her other platforms where she can share her, her life story and her journey of victory, victory in Christ, for she has won that battle. We pray and we cover her with the blood of Jesus. We know that wherever she speaks, people will hear and self-diagnose and become more aware of their own thoughts and how their thoughts are, are causing them to get depressed. We thank you, Father, for another fantastic evening at your feet. You have done it again today, and we are in awe of you. So, Lord, continue to be with us. Um, give us a chance to go back and listen to these talks and to, to be able to learn from them again and again and again. We cover every single sister with the blood of Jesus and even their partners who are in the background, their husbands, their brothers who are listening to this. May they also be blessed and may they share all the great things they have learned today. In your name, Jesus, have we prayed with thanksgiving. I, do, I, I didn't hear from Pastor Adeline. I'm, I'm not sure if she's Amen. able to. I'm here. Yay, here. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sister Nanaya. Thank you, oh. Sister Fiona. Oh. Thank you, Sister Na. Thank you, Dr. Jonathan. Thank you, all sisters. Oh. Tonight has been really awesome. We are grateful. We are grateful. Let's continue in prayer. Father, we thank you. We are grateful unto you. We don't take this time in your presence for granted at all. The words that have come out from our resource persons are spirit and life. And I believe that, Father, you have caused those words to be planted on fertile soil in our hearts. We thank you for the divine wisdom we have received tonight. And we pray that none of us is leaving this place the same. All 70, 75 of us are leaving this place blessed and encouraged. We thank you, Lord, that there is a reason why you put your spirit upon us. There is a reason why you have anointed us so that we can preach good news to the poor. We thank you that that is exactly what has been done here this evening. That this evening you have caused the brokenhearted to be put together again. That this evening, even as your word has come forth, even as testimonies have come forth, we believe that freedom for the captives have been provided, that there has been a release from darkness for them that are bound, that, Father, as the words came forth, we believe that you were speaking forth light into dark situations. You were speaking forth light. You were releasing us of burdens. There have been times when we've wondered, how are we going to handle this? You've shown us, even through the scriptures, how others went through it. Father, we thank you. We are grateful unto you. We thank you that Sister Na is a living testimony. We thank you that Brother Jonathan himself, apart from his practice, is also a living testimony, that he's walked it. We are grateful unto you. It gives us hope. It gives us encouragement. We thank you that by the word of our testimony, 
And Father, we have overcome the works of the enemy in the homes where depression has still been reigning. Oppression is going on. Suppression is going on. There is some form of difficulty or the other. Let there be light has always been the solution to eradicate permanently the darkness. We are praying in the name of Jesus tonight. Light has gone forth. Light has gone forth. Light has gone forth. Let the burdens be lifted. Every voice of suicide be silenced in the name of Jesus. The enemy told Jesus, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written that he will give his angels charge over you. Though he was quoting scriptures, he was speaking a lie because he wanted Jesus to take a shortcut. He wanted Jesus to take his life. I pray in the name of Jesus, anybody ever feeling such a burden, I pray, oh God, and I ask for mercy that Lord in the name of Jesus they will hold on to the truth as we have heard today let our lives be centered among around Jesus for it is only in him that all things hold together may our lives not be centered around marriage around money around fame around wealth around health or whatever but let it be rooted in you and in you alone for it is in you that all things hold together father we thank you we thank you I pray that more testimonies will flow. Many will come out to encourage another. We will not be shy. We will not stay back for it is in these very victories that you receive glory. It is in these very victories that others had delivered. Father, you created us and you called us forth to live a victorious Christian life. And as such, deliverance is our portion. Healing is our portion. In fact, it is our bread. I pray that each of us will never lack this bread in the name of Jesus. I thank you. I thank you for this resource people that have ministered to us. Father, fill them, fill them with more and more of your divine wisdom, your anointing, your power, your presence, your peace. Bring unto them many that need to receive from you in the name of Jesus, that they may minister forth that which you have helped them to walk, that which you have helped them to overcome in the name of Jesus. I thank you. I thank you. I pray for Sister Nanaya and Sister Fiona. I pray for them, Father, even as they keep hosting these sessions over and over again, week after week. Father, continue to bless them, anoint them together with the rest of the How To Series team leaders in the name of Jesus. Cause them always to bring up topics that are led by the Spirit, topics that will set the captive free, topics that will open up our eyes, topics that will help and encourage us. I speak life over each one. None shall walk in depression in the name of Jesus. None shall succumb to suicidal thoughts in the name of Jesus. Father, no matter how difficult the situation is, each shall come out victorious in the name of Jesus. Any kind of attack on any sister here or any uh, any member of our family on husbands. There are husbands that we know that are going through such situations right now. As we are praying, Father, you know exactly what we are talking about. We are standing in the gap for them. Send forth help to them right now. There are wives that don't know what to do. They don't know who to talk to. Send forth help to them right now. Help going straight into their hearts. Let them receive a word in season. Let it pierce deep into their hearts setting them free in Jesus' name. There are children that are experiencing depression. They don't know who to talk to. They don't know which way to turn to. Sister now shared a point at which she actually overdosed on expired medication. But Father, you preserved her. We have a father that neither sleeps nor slumber. Even when we make mistakes, he watches over us. Even when we do things that we shouldn't do, he cares. Even when mama and dada don't know what is going on, sister now was being preserved for this woman has a destiny. 
In the same way, Dr. Jonathan was being preserved for this treasure. He has a destiny. I thank you that our children are covered. Our children are covered in the blood. Our spouses are covered in the blood. Each and every one of us are covered in the blood. I decree over everyone that we shall fulfill our God-given assignment in the name of Jesus. For our God whom we serve is faithful. The good work he's begun in each and every one of us, he will accomplish it. He will complete it. The devil will not have the victory. In the mighty name of Jesus, we give you praise, Lord. We give you glory. We thank you. As we retire to bed and as others continue on the next session on the Holy Ghost hour, I pray, oh God, Father, that even for those who go to bed, our spirits will still be in constant communication with you. Daddy, speak to us. Instruct us whether we are awake or we are asleep, whether we are sleeping or whatever. Let constant instructions be coming through in the name of Jesus. Let us consistently be engaging with you, consistently receiving from you in the mighty name of Jesus. Let each of us be faithful in the secret place. Father, we praise you. We thank you for what you have done here tonight. We thank you for what you have done here tonight. Every suicidal spirit, every depressive spirit, every oppressive spirit, we forbid you, we forbid you from having access to any of us, nor our family members, in the mighty name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, brood over us. Holy Spirit, have your way with us. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Holy Spirit, rest upon us. Fill us with your joy. Fill us with your peace. Cover us with the oil of gladness. Grant unto us beauty instead of ashes. Put upon us a garment of praise. Change our appetites, Lord, in the name of Jesus, and cause us to be a blessing wherever we find ourselves. Every lie of the enemy be silenced and cause truth to reign in our lives in the name of Jesus. I thank you for hearing us. And I thank you that every decree that matches with your word of God comes to pass for your word is living and active. In Jesus' name, we have prayed with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. 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 Um, thank you so much. God bless you, Pastor Adlan. God continue to um, use you to minister unto us deeply and greatly. Amen. Um, now, sisters, if you are able to unmute, you can kindly unmute so that we can share the grace together. And those of us who can stay for um, the 10, 10 prayers, do stay. So if we can share the grace, let me just start the recording. So, and 